Welcome into Rover Sports here. It is Tuesday, June 27th, and we welcome in now a very special guest from Gator Break, from SEC Breakdown, Florida Gators. You can catch his show on YouTube all the time. It's my friend uh, David Waters. And David, how are you tonight? I'm doing well. Looking forward to talking some Gators football with you. Absolutely. And and David, you know, this is your first time here on Rover Sports. So for our listeners, I want you to just, um, you know, talk about your background as a Florida Gator fan and, and talk about your childhood growing up and watching the Gators. And when did you really fall in love with Florida football? Uh, pretty much I didn't have a choice from, from my father. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, he, he was born and raised in Jacksonville and, and grew up a Florida Gators fan, and that kind of just bled over uh, to me, you know. And uh, I fell in love with the, with the game of football, you know, especially growing up. Um, I'm 34 now, so I got to grow up in the, in the 90s and seeing Steve Spurrier and his fun and gun throwing it all over the field with, with Danny Wuffle and Doc Red Green, Ike Hill, Rido Anthony, Chris Doring, uh, Fred Taylor in the backfield, and Fred Weary and – Javon Curtis on the defensive side, Mike Peterson, you know, all those names in the 90s that we know, and then on to Rex Grossman, and then Steve Spurrier retires. And we have the, the, the dark days of Ron Zook era where, you know, the good thing was Ron Zook could still beat Georgia. So it was, uh, you know, even though Ron Zook lost some games he shouldn't have, as long as he could beat Georgia, uh, that was a good thing. As, uh, it, my, me and my parents, we, we moved to Georgia. Uh, so I was still a Gator fan raised in Georgia. So you can imagine how that was. Uh, all my best friends are now Georgia fans. But you know, as I mentioned, we had the Ron Zook uh, era, and then now, uh, you know, uh, eventually led to the Urban Meyer era, and what a lot of people consider some of the best times uh, in Gator athletics when you had uh, Urban Meyer, Tim, Tim Tebow, and Percy Harvin, Brandon Spice, Joe Hayden, Janoris Jenkins, and all those stars, and that that went on to win you know, two national championships in 2006 and 2008. You know, it was a lot of good time there. I just graduated college. I got a job in television. I was on the sideline for almost every game in uh, the Urban Meyer era. So, you know, to see that team up close and all those stars, and you know, especially led by Tim Tebow being uh, from around here in the Jacksonville area, being able to follow his career uh, pretty closely out Florida, you know, it, it was a sight to see uh, and being uh, really, really close uh, to that team. So, you know, now we're here, you know, after much champ, and now to Jim McElwain where, you know, Florida football may – uh, be getting his legs back under him after uh, Will Muschamp kind of ran the program into the ground. So recruited very well, just didn't develop uh, the offensive side of the ball. What Florida is known for, you know, so, and that's what I grew up watching. So you know, we're looking for Jim McElwain to, to finally get that uh, offense turned around and, and have Gator Nation uh, happy with, with the ball being thrown all over the field. How how special? Uh, you, you mentioned that you were you were <clears throat> on the sideline, um, you know, for two thousand and eight. And and how special was that 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 team in 2008? Do you think that's one of the greatest college football teams ever? I mean, you mentioned Tebow and even you know Joe Hayden and Carlos Dunlap and Spikes, you know, on the defensive side. I mean, how special was that 2008 team to watch? It, it was really special. I mean, you, know, you, you go back and and of course the the one memory that we go back to and you know the the, the thing that penalizes that team is you know is losing that home to L O Miss. Uh, in, in that season, you know, Tim Tebow gets stuffed on fourth down, and uh, Ole Miss upsets the Gators in the swamp. And you know, uh, I will never ever forget being in the media room after that game, being in that same room when Tebow makes his speech. You know, he walks in the media room, and you could tell that he had been emotional, probably in the locker room, and comes in and, and does the famous speech everybody knows. And you, you could have heard a pin drop. Uh, you know, I, I knew. At that moment, that was a, a, a turning point, uh, uh, a big moment uh, in Gator lore right there. And you know, everybody just kind of looked around at themselves and was like, okay, this, this guy's serious. And Florida went on the tear for the rest of the season. Not, not many close games uh, throughout the rest of the season. And then went to the national championship game and, and held a, a Oklahoma offense that had been scoring 40 points a game to 14 points in that game. And you know, coming out with Urban Meyer's second national championship in Florida. So, uh, you know, it was kind of sad to see it all come crashing down the next year in the SEC capture game against Alabama. And, you know, we know what happened to Urban Meyer after that. But that, that 2018, because of what happened uh, with, when I mentioned that Ole Miss game and kind of what happened after, and that team will always kind of leave a, uh, a great taste uh, in Gator fans' mouth. And, you know, you you covered Tim Tebow. 
and also Tebow that year, he lost the Heisman, the Bradford. And I also think that that helped with the motivation, you know, going into the national championship game. And you, you said that you covered, you know, the Gators and you were along the sidelines, you know, watching Tebow as he developed as a guy from Nice. And then he helped Chris Leak in 2006 coming in for gadget plays. Was there any fit? Was there a moment maybe that, um, you saw Tebow like in the media room and you're like, this, this guy's just cut from a different cloth. This is one of the more, you know, motivational and, and, and spiritual athletes that, you know, you've ever covered. Is, is there any great Tebow stories where you're like, this guy is going to be special because, you know, this personality doesn't come along often? I mean, you can kind of tell, you know, his freshman year, uh, his, yeah, you kind of mentioned it coming in, and you know, it was one of my very first assignments when I got the job at a TV station here in Jacksonville was go to cover Gators Media Day. And, and we get there, and this is a true freshman quarterback who has yet to play a snap for Florida, and he has the biggest, he has the biggest media conglomerate around him, and he handled it like a champ. And I'm sitting there, you know, putting a microphone on him, and you know, I'm kind of nervous. You know, I'm just straight out of college, and this is my first big job, and you know, you got setting this big gigantic interview up. You know, I can't miss. This, stuff. this is the first thing I'm doing, but you know he was relaxed and calm and, and uh, helped uh, me along the way. You know, yeah, I was a little bit older than him at the time, but you know, it was it was more about me doing my job and not messing that part up. And you know, and he was great. He handled it with poise, and you know, it was his first time being around you know, the Florida Gator media that he would be around for the next four years of his career. Uh, and, and and he handled it with, with class, and that was just a. Uh, you, you could kind of just tell the way he handled that moment right there. His first big time spotlight moment, you know, this guy was cut from a different cloth. He he can be, you know, something special. Yeah, yes, we had yet to see him on the field, um, and then we eventually saw uh, what he could do as a freshman when he, like as you mentioned, come in and, and help uh, convert some third downs, convert some fourth downs, and keep jobs alive for the Skater team, and you know, hit some big passes, uh, of course, and then the big jump pass to take Casey against LSU that year, and you know, that just kind of. That's kind of when the Tebow war just really, really started and took off uh, for Gator Nation and around the nation. So, you know, kind of remembering that first moment when I was around him and then seeing what he could do on the field and merging those two points together, it was not any surprise whatsoever to see what he come out and did in 2007 and 2008. We're talking here with David Waters. He works on SEC Breakdown, and he uh, represents the Florida Gators, and he's been covering the Gators for a long time, and um, we're really glad to have him here on Rover Sports. You mentioned Will Muschamp, and you were there for the, I believe, the 11-2 and year with Jeff Driscoll. Might have been 2010 or 2011, and then Will Muschamp, uh, was only there, I believe, maybe two more seasons after that, and now uh, he went to he went to Auburn, recruited well there, and now he's at South Carolina. And you saw Will Muschamp up close and personal. Do you believe that South Carolina is going to have trouble offensively, even though they have Jake, uh, you know, um, even though they have Bentley at quarterback and they have Brian Edwards and Rico Dattle, they have some talent. Do you think that Will Muschamp is just going to struggle though? Um, offensively, if he couldn't get it done at Florida with the players that he could recruit in the state, do you think it's going to be tough for South Carolina to to be consistent offensively under Muschamp here? Uh, surprisingly, I, I don't. Uh, I was a Muschamp fan, and don't get me wrong, he he needed to be fired from Florida, and it, you know we needed to move on from Will Muschamp. It just wasn't going to work, but. Uh, I, I like Will Muschamp's demeanor. I like the way he handled himself. It just wasn't going to work. And I, I think he learned some lessons at Florida where you know, maybe he shouldn't have come in and tried to change so much at one time. He wanted to come in. He wanted to be Alabama-like. He wanted to come in and change the culture right away and, and be in a smash-mouth type of offense. And he brought in uh, Charlie Weiss's first year. Weiss left to, to go to Kansas after his first year. Kind of left him in a uh, in a weird situation there where he went and, went and got Brent Pease uh, from Boise State to be the offensive coordinator. That never really hit it off. You mentioned the 2012 uh, season where they only had one regular season loss against Georgia. Um, you know, and still went, but went on to the Sugar Bowl to lose to, win, to lose to Louisville to give them their second loss of the season. But you know, that team was, was stacked in defense. But still, you know, with Jeff Driscoll leading the way, you kind of thought that might be the year. Okay, Driscoll's got some legs under him. Let's set up for a big 2013. And you know, it, it, the opposite happened. You know, Florida fell flat on their face and went four and eight the very next year. Yes, injuries played a big part in 
that. But it was just it was even. But they had lost to Miami, uh, you know, a couple weeks before um, they went on their losing streak. You know, that they went they lost to Miami, come back home and beat Tennessee. But then after that, the season just kind of fell apart. Uh, after Jeff Driscoll got hurt uh, against Tennessee, you had Tyler Murphy come in that game, and then. You just the offense could never get clicking. Will Muschamp was dealt some bad luck out for it. I'll be the first to admit that. But he also didn't help himself. While he recruited defense better than anybody, the offensive side of the ball is still right. He still could never find that quarterback. And he, once he, Mike Gillisley left, the running game never really could get his legs under it either. And eventually Kurt Ripley came in, but it was a little bit too little too late. Uh, Jeff Driscoll was never the same quarterback after 2012. He could never build on that season. Uh, Treon Harris was a little average at best under his one season at Kurt Roper, you know, with Kurt Roper at OC. And you know, it, it, it just it was the combination of things for Will Muschamp uh, non-success at Florida. But I do think he can have some better a better success at South Carolina. I do think he's learned some lessons from his time at Florida. He's got a great quarterback in Bentley who might be the SEC East's best quarterback right now. He's got weapons at receiver that we've just seen from one year there. So you know, can he build, can him and Kurt Roper get on the same page and build the offense? I think that was another thing. He was never on the same page with the offensive coordinators at Florida. I think he learned he needs to be more hands-off let the offensive coordinator do that job, do their job. He can he can still coach defense with Tavares Robinson, the defensive coordinator there at South Carolina, and be good that way. So I think eventually he can have success at South Carolina. Now I think that barometer of success is different than it is at Florida. You know, eight nine wins. If he can consistently do that, then maybe they'll kind of up the ante where they want more. But I really do think Will Muschamp can be a consistent eight nine win coach when everything is said and done at South Carolina. Yeah, and that's impressive, you know, for for USC there uh, to get to eight and nine wins. You know, Spurger he he took the expectations of South Carolina to a whole new level. Um, when you look um, also around the SEC, you have Butch Jones, and you know Butch Jones in Tennessee. Really, the 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 game that really was his saving grace was the second half against Florida. Uh, you guys and Austin Appleby got off to a great start in that game with Callaway. Um, you know, running down the sidelines. It might have been twenty. 20- 21-3, and then Josh Dobbs, you know, he really heated up in the second half there, and I guess just, you know, the, the Florida corners were gassed in that game. What do you think about Butch Jones? Do you think that he's going to be a coach that plateaus at nine wins, or um, or do you think Butch has a, um, or do you think Butch Jones can be a guy that, you know, can get to 10 or 11 wins with Tennessee? Yeah. Much like I'm putting kind of on Michael, and Michael they don't go in there and doesn't have the hot seat that Jones is on. But I think this is a, 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 a pretty telling season for both coaches. They might go in and get the offense turned around. But the Butch Jones, can he, you know, last year was such a disappointment for Tennessee. And can they get over the hump? This is a year to get over the hump. You know, can can they do something like they did in, in, in 97 to 2000 or from 97 to 98, kind of where in 97 they might have been win the national championship. It might have been the, the year to do something and pick Manning for last year, but they end up winning the national championship the next year with T. Martin. Can that kind of be the sim- same similar scenario here where the year they were supposed to be picked to do something, but it actually happens the next year? And I actually think the offense can be a little better uh, with Josh Dobbs not being there. Now they can open up the offense with Clinton Dormady uh, and, and, you know, if he's the quarterback that takes over. This offense can be opened up a little bit more. They not necessarily have to run with the quarterback. This is a quarterback now that can test the ball down the field, but I'm still questioning that defense. Yes, I know a lot of young players played last year because of injury, but you, it, it, but you still can't lose to South Carolina the way you lost to South Carolina. You can't lose to Vanderbilt the way you lost to Vanderbilt where they just marched up and down the field on them. That, that, that can't happen when you're Tennessee in that scenario where all you had to do was win a couple games and you were representing the SEC East. Yes, those guys now have experience, but how good is that experience? And those guys didn't necessarily play well when they had an opportunity to play well against Vanderbilt in, in the life of South Carolina. So, you know, I question that the brought, they brought in Bob Sheep as defensive coordinator who was supposed to help those, fix those issues, and that didn't happen. Uh, yes, I would be the first in the injuries played a huge part in that, but it's still no excuse to fall flat on their face like they did. So, there is a lot of pressure. And I think that's the, the, the one thing I'm really ready to, to look for and what Butch Jones can do when they kick off against Georgia Tech. How is he going to handle this pressure uh, with the, the hot seat talk and, and, and following up a disappointing season? I'm ready to see how he reacts there. And, and if I had to make 
make a prediction right now. I don't think they get that defense fixed. They have a very tough schedule. They play Alabama. They play LSU out of the West. They have the, the toughest West slate out of any SEC East team. And you still got to play Florida. You still got to play Georgia. You still got to try. Butch Jones hasn't beat Will Muschamp yet. No matter where he's coached out, Florida or South Carolina. So Butch Jones has a lot of questions to answer in 2017. Yeah, he can't get over the hump versus Muschamp, but, you know, you make an interesting point there about Joshua Dobbs and going forward now with, Dorn- with uh, Quentin Dormady or, or Guantana, we'll have to see, we'll have to see, you know, if that offense, you know, if that offense really changes and, um, you know, before I let you run, obviously, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, this quarterback situation. It's official now. Malik Zaire is headed now to Florida. And I'll tell you the truth, Dave. You know, I, I really looked at um, Felipe Franks, and I've been really impressed with his uh, with his high school tape. I think the guy has all the tools to be a tremendous, you know, quarterback in the SEC. He even has NFL aspirations when you look at his skill set. Do you think that bringing in Malik Zaire, do you think that's going to kind of inhibit his growth? Do you think it's going to be a shot at, you know, Felipe's confidence? Because I bet Felipe was looking at this year as his debut season, and now he's going to have to beat out Zaire for the starting job. So how do you think Zaire is going to impact Felipe's development? That's the magic question, you know. When you go back and look at Felipe Franks, and you go back to his high school days, and he played in more of a um, uh, kind of a wing T offense where they did throw the ball a, a good bit more because of that, but he didn't have a quarterback coach. They didn't have a quarterback coach at his high school to go over, you know, throw emotions and footstep, uh, foot, footwork as, as much as you would like. Um, so, you know, he was going to be very raw quarterback when he was recruited. You know, he was a four star, but a lot of that four star was based off of his size and his arm strength and the potential that you could see from Felipe Frank and, and a tape that you watch. So, he was going to be a bit of a project anyway, and I know there's a lot of talk about burning his red shirt toward the end of last year, maybe playing in the bowl game, you know, moving on from Luke Del Rio was hurt, moving on from Austin Appleby and letting, you know, um, Felipe Franks get a, a month in of, of bowl practice and play him in the bowl game. But, you know, Jim McElwain decided, uh, you know, to go ahead and just go with Austin Appleby and keep the red shirt on Franks. So, now you move forward, you, you go through another spring where Felipe Franks just went through his second spring. You know, he looked okay in the spring game. It probably set up for him a little bit to, to have some success. But, you know, I think there was enough there to see. You, you saw the arm strength. You saw the downfield accuracy there. And you, we came out of spring thinking, okay, this is Felipe Franks' job. We're ready to see this quarterback Jim McElwain and Doug Nussmeyer recruited to take over. Now we <laughs> fast forward a couple months and, you know, you have Notre Dame grad transfer Malik Zaire coming in, and it, it is it, it does make you wonder what goes through the head of, of Felipe Franks. Did he was he planning on being the starter? And now, you know, you what you hope happens is okay. There's a quarterback coming in who can take my job. You hope this you know sets him up to to be a little more confident. He can go into to fall practice and say, you know what, I've been here a year and a half. You know, this is my job. You come take it from me. There's nothing to be given from you. Maybe this makes Felipe Frank better. Maybe this presses him a little bit. As I mentioned, we were coming out of spring thinking Felipe Frank has a job. Now, now he's going to be pushed. Maybe this makes him better. Maybe this, you know, sets up for Jim McElwain and Doug Nussmeyer, a quarterback they recruited, what Florida fans want to see, a quarterback they recruited, take over, and they can build uh, on something going towards 2018. But, you know, Malik Zaire, I'm sure he, one reason he came to Florida and waited for the SEC to change this bad transfer rule was to come in and believe he has a good chance of starting. So it's going to be a quarterback battle. I'm sure Florida fans would love just one quarterback to, to come in and take all the practice reps and, and get a rapport with the receiver. But it's going to be another off season where you're looking at – or another fall camp where you're looking at a split reps with quarterbacks, much like – Will, uh, Will Greer and Treon Harris and Jim McElwain's first year. You know, maybe we'll get an answer soon. Maybe uh, before Michigan, uh, there's a starter name. But I, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't put it past McElwain to, to keep that a secret when Florida kicks off against Michigan game one. Florida's defense last year was really the calling card of, of the team and, and you and you watched them, you know, when they went to Vanderbilt, shut down that offense and ended at LSU, the famous you know, fourth down, you know stop at the goal line to, to win and secure the SEC East last year, you know, you lose a lot of stars, especially 
Um, you know, in the secondary, you know, with Mays and Tabor um, leaving and then Gerard Davis, the linebacker, going to the Lions. So you guys had a lot of first round talent that departed, but there were some injuries and and some guys did get experience last year. Um, I want you to just talk about this defensive line in particular, David. You know, D uh, Taven Bryan, C.C. Jefferson, these are guys that are poised, I think, to have pretty big seasons. And then how do you think that Duke Dawson and Chauncey Gardner, you know, playing corner, do you think that they'll be able to um, be consistent enough for Florida to, to really have a top-notch defense again? You know, you have to – to respect the players that just left, you have to kind of say this part of the offense this year will take a step back. You know, you, you, you mentioned the names, Jalen Tabor, Quincy Wilson, Marcus May, Jared Davis, Alexander Loney. You know, you have to do those guys a service and, and saying, you know, this defense won't miss a step. Well, you're kind of doing those guys who just left who are now playing in the NFL a disservice. Of course this defense will, will, will take a step back. But it doesn't have to be a huge step back. You know, you go back in time and maybe 2007 is the last time you can look at, at a Florida defense and say, okay, that wasn't a Florida standard defense. You know, from one year out of the last 20, 25 years, you can sit here and say, okay, the defense kind of disappointed a little bit. Uh, but now you, you fast forward to 2017, and, and you mentioned C.C. Jefferson. He's going to anchor that defensive line. He's a five-star recruit, uh, one of Jim McElwain's only five-star recruits so far. And, you know, we're going to see what C.C. Jefferson can do. He's going to be the guy they're going to count on now uh, at defensive end. You know, he kind of had a, a split time between defensive tackle and defensive end last year. Um, but you'll see him more at defensive end uh, this year. That's far it really gets him a crunch at defensive tackle. And that's going, to, that's going to be very important for this Florida defense. I believe the starting 11 can be really, really good. If they start getting injuries like they did in the second half of last year, that's when you might start questioning this Florida defense and having to start playing some more young guys, You know, especially at defensive tackle. You mentioned Kerry Clark and Taven Bryan. Those guys are going to play defensive tackle, but there's not much behind them. Kyrie Campbell, Tadarrell Slayton, Elijah Collins, you know, those are the guys that are yet to play in a Gator uniform that you're going to be asked to to, to uh, fill in uh, when those guys are hurt or, or when those guys are tired, when those, maybe those guys become injured. You have, you're asking a, a, a lot from guys who are yet to play uh, in a Gator uniform. But you, and, and we mentioned his injuries from last year from, you know, uh, Jared Davis and Alex Gonzalez. So Kylan Johnson, David Reese, and Sean Joseph, those guys got a lot of playing time against the likes of Arkansas, uh, LSU, South Carolina, Florida State, Alabama, and the bowl game last year. You know, those guys really came on and, and it looked like a group that Florida can really count on that linebacker. And then you mentioned Duke Dawson and Chauncey Gardner taking over for the Stars at cornerback. And I, be, I believe Duke Dawson, you, you, you won't really see a, a beat miss there. He really played that great at nickel position last year. He's going to slide outside and, and be the main corner for Florida. Uh, Chauncey Gardner, I believe, will start the season at the opposite cornerback position. Uh, but, yeah, Florida recruited really, really well uh, to be able to maybe slide a true freshman in there with Marco Wilson or um, – uh, Bam, there's some little uh, names uh, escaping me from freshmen, but uh, Marky Wilson, Quincy Wilson's little brother, uh, is a little guy that I was throwing out there uh, who, who can come in and, and maybe be uh, a guy that can count as a true freshman. They would really like to slide, I believe, Chauncey Gardner back to nickel, let him play safety a little bit more to become more of a playmaker in the middle of the field, like we saw in the bowl game uh, against Iowa. He had a pick six for a, 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 you know, a touchdown that kind of sealed the game away uh, for the Gators. They also had a pick six in the FSU game as well. So you know, they would like to keep Chuck Gunner as more of a playmaker in the middle of the field instead of sliding him out and, and keeping him just to one side of the field. So you know, I, I do think, as I believe, just starting 11 for this part of defense can be very good. But what may be problematic is they start getting the injury bug like they did in the second half of last year. Right on, David. Unbelievable stuff, man. Before I let you run, I, I wanted to um, I wanted to go ahead and talk about your podcast. You know, talk about the podcast you have with Mark Rogers. It, you know, you break down all the Florida Gators things. And uh, what do you guys got coming up for the month here of July? I know it's tough because training camp, you know, is uh, I know fall camp isn't back yet. But uh, what do you guys have in store? And just talk a little bit about your podcast so some of some of uh, some of our listeners can go ahead and listen to you guys and see you guys. Yeah, if you can break it down, you can find it on YouTube. Uh... The Gators breakdown has kind of been the the, the, uh, 
the show of record there. We start, FTC Breakdown was kind of started a year ago, but kind of fell apart a little bit when some people left. So, you know, I went kind of off to the side and started Gators Breakdown. And, you know, that's the, the podcast you can find on, on YouTube, SoundCloud, iTunes there. Uh, but FTC Breakdown is kind of be re- rebranded right now. So you can find me and Mark Rogers doing some, some Gators talk. And then we have also got a, a, a uh, Crimson Tide uh, breakdowns, the Tide breakdowns, the South Carolina uh, Gamecocks breakdown, and also the Tennessee one with Balls breakdown. So we're trying to branch out a little bit to more teams. Uh, so you can find uh, myself, Mark Rogers, uh, Mike LaFall for the last word on sports with Tennessee, and uh, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Will Gunter for South Carolina. You know, those guys you know, do a really, really, really good, really good job. Stephen Smith for uh, Touchdown Alabama heads up the Alabama one with Mark Rogers as well. So, you know, we, we've got some more SEC teams covered. Uh, right now it's a lot of top five lists, top five safeties, top five position breakdowns uh, coming up for this coming up season. So, yeah, a lot going on there. Uh, SEC breakdown and Gators breakdown. Uh, as I mentioned, so Gators breakdown for, for me, uh, me and two other guys, Bill, Bill Sykes and, and Joe Vizzy. We've knocked that out and had some great guests on lately. Had Jock West Green on last night, former Gator great, Ben Troop. Uh, Chris Doring back in the spring as well. So there's some Gator greats joining us, uh, but uh, you won't find better Gator, Gators coverage in a podcast form out there. Unbelievable stuff, Dave. It was, it was a lot of fun having you on, man. You're welcome back anytime in the Rover Sports. Have a great night. Thank you so much.